Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear friends, welcome to the Forum 2000. Uh, initially planned as a one-off event, it is now meeting for its 18th session. That says something about the inspiration provided by its founding father, President Václav Hauer, but also uh, about the relevance of the issues that we have discussed over the years at Forum 2000 and that we plan to continue this year. Uh, the Forum was not meant as an institution, though you may wonder if it's not becoming one, uh, nor was it meant as an academic gathering, of which there are many, to discuss uh, globalization. It was meant as a meeting place for people with <coughs> uh, from different walks of life, from different parts of the world, who would come to Prague and share in a dialogue, uh, taking a step back from their immediate agendas and take the long term, or as Václav Havel would say, a civilizational perspective on them. Over the years, a network of people with shared concerns was established around the founder of the Forum, Václav Havel. He himself introduced the Forum many times and described what he had in mind. And uh, I can only uh, add from what he tried to do, uh, the Forum to be two main uh, concerns. Uh, two key issues, questions that he wanted the forum to address. One was, what should be the spiritual foundations of coexistence in a new international order? And I quote him, I believe that there exists a spiritual and moral minimum that is shared by all, or at least the vast majority of all cultures and spheres of civilizations in the world today. That question of a moral minimum implies a dialogue, an ongoing conversation to which the Forum 2000 tries to contribute. Uh, the second major concern for Václav Havel uh, with respect to Forum 2000 was democracy and human rights. And uh, that was obviously related to his own itinerary and to the fate of his country and this part of the world. Uh, but Václav Havel always also uh, combined this with a reluctance to a very complacent view that prevailed after 1989 about the irresistible triumph of democracy and the liberal order. Um, he was perfectly aware of the inherent weaknesses and vulnerabilities of democracies. And you can read his speeches on the subject, including at Forum 2000, as an invitation to rethink the democratic predicament. Uh, which brings us to the topic of this year's forum, democracy and its discontent. 25 years after the fall of the old dictatorships in Prague and elsewhere in the region, uh, it is appropriate to look back and reflect on the state of democracy today. I'm struck by a double paradox, which shapes the context of our discussion today. Uh, 25 years on, nobody is seriously questioning the legitimacy of the democratic system, uh, at least in this part of the world. Uh, nobody would want to turn the clock back. Yet, there is a widespread disenchantment and frustration with the hollowing out of the democratic process and a growing gulf between the political elites and the population. Uh, secondly, democratic credentials are invoked by all kinds of regimes uh, uh, which uh, have a very interesting and dubious interpretations of uh, what that means in practice. And that ranges from managed democracy of Vladimir Putin to illiberal democracy of Viktor Orban. So that is one uh, 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 irony of the situation. Democracy is invoked by everybody, but uh, that there is a snag in that triumph of the word. 
secondly, we have democratic protesters in recent years that have taken part in various parts of the world, uh, from the Arab Spring to Kiev uh, to Hong Kong recently. Uh, you could then speak of the universality of democratic aspirations. Yet paradoxically, the state of democracy where we thought it was well established is being questioned, is problematic. And just as in the 90s you had the industry of transitions to democracy conferences, now you have endless conferences about the crisis of democracy. And, you know, the familiar symptoms are uh, declining voter participation in all Western countries, uh, decline in the trust, not just in governments or political elites, but it actually in representative institutions, which is much more worrying. And in many democratic countries in Europe and elsewhere, we have seen protests that have taken place from below and outside existing party and political structures. So what are the causes of the current discontent with democracy? And what does it tell us about the changing nature of the democratic process uh, in Europe and more broadly in the, in the world today? Uh, to address some of these questions, we have a distinguished panel gathered here, and I will introduce the speaker in the order uh, uh, that I was given, uh, and we'll start uh, uh, with Iveta Radicova, well known in this country, needs no introduction, as the formula says, uh, sociologist by academic training, prime minister, and now probably in a very good position to reflect both as a sociologist and as a former politician on the state of democracy today. So Iveta Radicova, the floor is yours. Good morning to everybody. Thank you very, very much. Uh, as usual, Jacques put on the table more than complicated question. <laughs> so what I would like to do is maybe only add some hypotheses or another questions. First of all, let me to start with uh, the sentence of one of the best economists, uh, Mr. Galbraith, who has said that 25 years ago what we uh, have faced was the deepest and hardest and most complicated transition during the last 50 years maybe century, from totalitarian regime to democracy. And it's absolutely clear that such a shift is always uh, interconnected with problems and has laws and regulations uh, how to promote. From the first euphoria for everybody to have a democracy, civic rights, human rights, through nostalgia to form a regime and question what is better, what kind of democracy? Democracy in the way of security and material goods or democracy as a procedure, democracy as a self-expression and freedom. It's clear that when there is a crisis, then more orientation of citizens is towards democracy to cover security and material goods and uh, standard of living. Therefore, sometimes nostalgia towards golden lamp, maybe as a slave, but with every day piece of bread and the house and uh, material um, satisfaction. So it's normal procedure to understand what does it mean to be responsible and free citizen. When we have a look what's going on, uh, European Union has received Nobel Prize and there was deep discussion 
if it's okay or not because of the crisis, because of the problems at EU. And Habermas uh, argued um, that, at least for three reasons, it's okay. First, keeping the peace in Europe. Second, building democracy. And third, welfare state. And if we have a look, all these three features of Europe are now in deep problems. We are really keeping the peace in Europe? I have to answer that no. We are really building consolidated democracy with satisfied citizens? I have to answer no. And what does it mean, our welfare state and orientation toward the strong state? I think the deepest and biggest risk for Europe. There is strong paradox. On one side, citizens are asking for more social rights and entitlements. It means stronger governments and stronger state and more redistribution. But if they ask for this, it's stronger state paternalism and less individual freedom and weaker civic society. At the end of the day, there is distrust towards pol uh, politicians as they are not able to cover more and more and more um, entitlements and social rights from the side of citizens. Uh, then we have on the table not the question if we need the state or if we need the government or what kind of state. The question is what kind of style of governing we have to ask to have what kind of decision-making process and what kind of relationship in between state on one side and civic society on another, on another side. Paradoxically, we are facing stronger states, therefore more and more dissatisfied citizens with the fulfilling of the role of the state and together with asking of more self-responsibility and freedom. Uh, to conclude introductory uh, question, okay, together with nostalgia, victimology, conspiration theories, uh, not very standard political uh, scene, and opening the space for absolutely non-standard political representation, we are facing at least three new phenomena. First, the phenomena of so-called oligarchia democracy. I think Czech Republic is a very good example, but also Hungary and also Slovakia and many other countries. Second, so-called party colonization of the state. Uh, in other words, strong division of winners and losers after elections. And last but not least, third and new phenomena, and this phenomena is paradox of the fight of self-responsible citizens face to face with stronger state. Thanks. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, opening statement, which addresses really the heart of the issues. I'm sure it, many of those will be uh, picked up by other speakers, especially the last one about the strong state. Many people nowadays say, no, what is being dismantled is precisely the power of you know, the welfare state is being dismantled and the states no longer have the capacity in a globalized world to 
uh, be responsive to the to the agenda set by the international crisis. So th this, I'm sure, will uh, will uh, issue will will come up soon. But the second speaker uh, to address the panel is uh, uh, Karl Schwarzenberg. Um, used to be president of the Helsinki Federation for Human Rights when I first met him in the 1980s in, in Vienna. He's known as close associate of President Václav Havel at the Prague Castle and uh, most recently foreign minister of the Czech Republic. So it's a great pleasure to give him the floor. Well, I do think we politicians, our values are interest for our job, uh, what we are working for. Uh, but human beings are human beings, and everything they do uh, follows the same rules. And only if you, for instance, the same interest as in politics, or even more, is naturally for football. Uh, and, but I presume there are in Europe more people who know the names of Chelsea, Real Madrid, Arsenal, or Tottenham, then they know the political parties in Europe. And uh, of course, if you are working in the fashion business, you know who is Dior and who is uh, Balenciaga or whoever, and the number of journalists who write about fashion and people who are selling dresses which you have all over the towns and so on, they are really interested in. But they don't have the illusion uh, that uh, they save the world, or that the people must be interested in fashion or in football. And um, evidently, but the interest uh, in it follows the same rules. There are things in fashion, and there are things out of fashion. Um, and the, 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 the same is with democracy. We had now, uh, in, whole, in Western Europe, already for 70 years democracy, in Eastern Central Europe, 25 years, and it starts to bore the people. Um, first of all, because uh, the performance of the actors is as good as it was before. Uh, they are less fascinating. Uh, they are gay, normal, democratic politician, politicians, and which, of course, is not really interesting. And um, therefore, uh, people who, as already the old Romans knew, need in politics, parliaments, transcendence. And if the parliament is now more or less assured, but the transcendence is lacking, so they turn to people who offer that. And uh, let's be honest, um, not to speak of the a great dictator, even a, a bit authoritarian rules. Um, there is no doubt that, for instance, the Hungarian Prime Minister, Mr. Orban, fascinates more people, is more interesting for the newspapers than, let's say, uh, his grey democratic uh, neighbours, the Prime Ministers of Austria or of the Czech Republic, of Slovenia. These are boring. He is interesting. And in the time where all our newspapers and all are just following the rules, what the news is about, you should be, should be astonished that the interest for uh, democracy is lesser and lesser. Because what uh, a democratic regime after World War II and after the fall of, of the Iron Curtain achieved in Europe, everybody takes as its natural right. They are forgetting that generations had to fight for it and that many people went to jail and prison or were executed fighting for democracy. That is past. 
Nobody interests that. As nobody is interested who won uh, the decisive uh, fights in uh, Mid Zealand football in the year 1968 or 1989. Who knows who won then the football, uh, was the best football team of Europe? Nobody forgets. The same with the politics. The politics of problems. The fight we had uh, only a few decades ago is interesting for historians, for students who are compiled for them, but that for the MH people. They are just bored by present politicians, they are bored by democracy. Uh, and uh, it's a normal thing. If you uh, think, for instance, only in the United States, what is the percentage of people who go to elections is even lower than in Europe. Only the Democrat Americans who have grown up uh, since generations only in democracy think it's such a natural thing that they don't even discuss it. Uh, we had uh, the unique chance in uh, two generations, three generations, try all kinds of dictatorships, authoritarian rules, semi democracies pseudo-democracies and so on. Uh, so we have still a choice. And of course, let's be honest, even in the worst of the regimes, some groups were privileged and some are thinking uh, because it was the time of their youth, rather with nostalgic thoughts um, on the days of the past. I will give you one example. I was, when I was 19, I was working in a timber company in Austria, and there were the warden and the woodcutters, and it was only uh, then 15 years after the war. And all of them, the men were, of course, in, in the German army, mainly in Russia. And when they spoke in the, in the 50s about World War II, they spoke uh, what a terrific experience were, how many of them were killed, how they were freezing in Russia, how terrible it was uh, uh, to be in a, uh, a Russian camp of prisoners. Okay. When I met those four people 25 years later, which I did quite a lot of them, the picture was as a well, the war was a time where of deep comradeship, where one helped each other, of great adventure, how well they shot, what, what adventures they have survived, and so on. And the, suddenly, the past have changed totally. And it was the same people I remembered how they talked 25 years before, you see? And the same thing, for instance, now happens here too. Um, People now think full of nostalgia of their younger times in the communist time and how they sang the Russian songs and how come when they went to brigade and so So we should be astonished as that democracy becomes much more, much less interesting than it was. And when my generation and other fought for it. Of course, and, and Let's admit too that as the uh, uh, democratic politicians in Europe don't offer anymore such colorful people as they did in the past. We don't have a church, we don't have a decor, uh, we don't have somebody uh, like Margaret Thatcher who fascinated the people. Uh, it is a normal democracy, rather boring politicians, people in dark blue or gray suits who, who are interchangeable for most of the people. So I think that's one element we underestimate because we, including the public room in this room, we, underestimate, we overestimate the importance of politics for most of the population. And then they are astonished 
but something happened to them because they didn't go to an election, they didn't vote, and they are very much astonished. But in normal life, they are not so interested. And as we have uh, the dangers still are looming, but they are recognizable, uh, they are not anymore. Uh, in the 30s, uh, <coughs> uh, sectors of the 30s, even if the blind man was, could see what dangers are for democracy in Europe. I do think the dangers are present to today, uh, but uh, it's still a bit far away, it's still looming, uh, and we do think it's, it's such a far away country uh, that it doesn't interest us. Uh, we have already again the phenomenon as the British Prime Minister uh, before Munich when he was discussing uh, the fate of Czechoslovakia said a faraway country we know little about. And that was the general view of British politics. And we have now what happens in Ukraine, a faraway country we, let, we know little about. And of course, the Islamic State, the Caliphate, is at least colorful uh, when with these murdered people and with the jalabiyas and executing still with the sword, which is like we saw last time uh, in the film, in the television, and now we see it uh, as a reality. That's, of course, for the moment interesting, therefore people are interested in the Islamic Caliphate. Uh, but uh, few of us uh, really recognize either the danger in, in the East or in the South. Uh, probably uh, the danger is to get closer again till we awake, till we realize that, that freedom, rule of law, and democracy was always an exemption in history, that it was never the normal state of affairs. Only if you live in it, you think it's a normal thing. I remember a uh, quarter century ago, an American history said, the end of history, uh, democracy, progress, freedom, rule, is installed in the world and it will never recede. Now we realize that it is uh, just another development, uh, that we uh, stumble back at some parts, like in, in the Middle East, Merrily into the Middle Age, and that uh, even in, in Western Europe, uh, there are quite a lot of politicians say, look uh, at China, look at Singapore, look at uh, authoritarian countries, how much better they have, uh, how less senseless discussions in the parliament. Uh, how efficient these regimes are, should we turn uh, away of this uh, liberal democracy with, as Margaret Thatcher said, the chatting class, and instead to turn to a system where there's a clear leadership, a clear decision, and you know where you're going to. Probably this tendency will increase in the next years. And we will be very astonished in what direction uh, European politics will go. Because after more than 70 years, my experience is that the, an historic experience you never can transfer from one generation to the other. Prejudices, yes. And that will influence European and world politics too. Uh, maybe, I hope at least, that Vladimir, Vladimir Rovich Putin will awake us and maybe he will be, be the man who moves a European Union to a greater unity and the European voters that they remember democracy and try to defend democracy. I'm not sure, but it's the only chance for the moment I see.
Okay, well, th th thanks very much, uh, Karel Schwarzenberg. Uh, interesting view that democratic fatigue, democratic discontent, boredom with democracy is actually something quite normal, quite trivial, quite banal. Uh, there was a novel by Alexander Clement, if I recall, Nudav Chekha, Boredom in Bohemia. This democracy. Democracy. This is, so to speak, the normalcy of, uh, of democracy. Well, that's one way. I suppose that's deep down the liberal view. You know, Benjamin Constant, the 19th century, said, you know, uh, uh, the main thing is freedom to enjoy uh, the freedoms to have this public space. Participation in politics, you know, that is optional. Politics is basically for people who get bored at home. If you're bored, you know, this is, this is you know, get active in politics. So that's the liberal detachment. Of course, one shouldn't push the argument too far. If you have political participation, the civic engagement completely collapsing, and you have a political elite detached from the rest of society, you may end up uh, with unpre unpredicted or unpredictable uh, upsurges. And we have seen throughout Europe and elsewhere movements of public protest that take place outside the realm of institutional politics, and that is in itself worrying situation. Anyway, uh, our uh, third speaker is uh, Chan Fen, who is a professor at the uh, law school uh, in Beijing, and his uh, most recent book is uh, called The Constitution of Chan. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank the organizer for inviting me here to this very important uh, forum and to give me this uh, um, extremely precious learning opportunity. Um, well, Czech or former Czechoslovakia used to be like China, but 25 years ago, the Iron Curtain fell, but Tiananmen Square remained the same uh, to this day. And probably repeating itself in Hong Kong. A little bit further, yeah. Further. Is that better? Okay, thanks. Um, so, s since then, the two uh, areas follow a very different path. You know, we've heard about the uh, discontent of uh, democracies, uh, but uh, um, I'm not the best person to speak on that because uh, we are yet to achieve democracy. But we have a lot of discontent uh, with authoritarianism, so I guess I'm here basically to bring, perhaps to bring you back some of the unpleasant memories of uh, non-democratic uh, systems. Um, now the former um, prime minister uh, mentioned the fragmentation of uh, democratic states. Um, China is on the opposite side. Uh, it remained a very powerful state, um, and um, um, frankly speaking, it uh, yeah it, it has maintained at least the apparent efficiency in running the government, and uh, has done a reasonably good job in keeping social stability and uh, rather um, high rate of uh, economic growth. Uh, the economy is uh, growing over seven or eight percent every year. Um, so um, I think there are virtues or benefits that comes with uh, authoritarianism, uh, but we do have uh, many problems, and I can summarize about five aspects. Well, the first is a rather serious abuse of human rights that we have uh, improved very dramatically over the past 30 years. Um, but uh, we, still re you know, we, we still remain to have serious problems, not only with respect to the political rights, right to elections, the right to free speech, but also we have serious problems with um, uh, inequality, with um, property rights, for example. Land taking has been a very serious issue in China. And has caused many social unrest. Uh, the second problem um, with the uh, sort of top-down uh, authoritarian system is its uh, rampant official corruption. 
uh, basically occurring at all levels and all departments. Now, um, the new gen uh, uh, general secretary, party secretary Xi Jinping, has waged a uh, rather forceful campaign against corruption. But people very much doubt about its efficacy because it's a systematic corruption we are confronting with. And uh, the um, anti-corruption campaign can at most be selective against individual officials and usually against political rivals. Okay. Uh, the third aspect is um, the uh, irresponsible and irrational policy making. Now, I talk about the achievement of China's uh, economic development, but that achievement comes with a very high price, very high social cost. You know, for example, the abuse of uh, uh, property rights, violation of property rights of uh, peasants and uh, city residents. Um, and also, uh, this overemphasis on economic development has sacrificed our environmental qualities and uh, resource. So the corruption has been uh, very serious, and my uh, plan flying over to uh, Prague uh, was delayed for one hour, which made me almost miss my connection flight because of the air quality. Okay. So um, here we may have this or that problem, but at least I see I can enjoy uh, clean air. Well, the fourth problem uh, has to do with the uh, rule of law. Um, I can easily prove that without a democratic system, then the rule of law is very problematic because we have um, um, tried to push for rule of law for the past 20 or 30 years. But so far, we have many laws. We have made um, uh, all, basically all the necessary laws for a good society. But the implementation of the laws has remained a very serious problem. And uh, this has to do with uh, the uh, overall undemocratic nature of the regime, um, which makes the government uh, irresponsible to the people and also the lack of uh, division of the powers among the uh, different government departments and having the power <clears throat> overly concentrated uh, in the uh, in the state and particularly in the central government and in the party. And I mentioned the anti-corruption campaign, the recent anti-corruption campaign. And this campaign is built on the, uh, it is pressed, premised upon the concentration of powers. So <clears throat> although it helped to uh, reduce corruption, but that's not the the way, that's not a persistent way to go because uh, the concentration of power tend to produce more corruption than it um, uh, resolves. And um, finally, the lack of democracy also reduces the legitimacy of the state and the overall unity of the state. Um, you know, we have many so-called uh, sensitive issues about Tibet, about Xinjiang, and also Hong Kong and Taiwan. I'm not saying that in a democratic state, all these issues would automatically disappear, uh, but the undemocratic way of handling things tend to uh, aggravate uh, many problems in these regions. So um, all these problems we talk about probably all exist in democratic countries as well. Um, but in a non-democratic country, we may come up with many solutions and we have constantly proposed solutions to the governments, but in vain, okay, because um, the vested interest is very much against the effective solution of the problems I just talked about. Uh, so in a democratic state, uh, things may not get better that quickly, but at least we have a reasonable platform to discuss these issues and have a chance to make it a policy of the state and to implement the policy rather effectively. Um, so um, I don't think you know, any one of us uh, would go back. So it is 
uh, I don't think it's terribly helpful to discuss the uh, discontent of uh, democracies, uh, if there's any discontent. Uh, rather, we need to find out why democracies have this discontent. What are the causes? And my understanding is that working, you know, uh, most of these problems arise because democracy is not working. And we need a working democracy to resolve these problems. So uh, I think we need to go back to uh, the political scientist, uh, Robert Putnam's notion of making democracy work and uh, explore the conditions for working democracy. You know, I think we need both cultural and institutional conditions for democracy to work. And uh, if we find some deficiencies, that is, if we find that some of these conditions are not met, is it possible to, um, to make up these deficiencies and build a stronger democracy? So I'm here to learn, and uh, I'll be very interested in hearing uh, you know, both the panelists and the audience to propose effective solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for this view from uh, Beijing. I think very interesting to hear because you have uh, this spectacular achievement. You know, you grow for, what, 8% a year for about a quarter of a century. And uh, uh, then you discover that any further development raises a democratic question. You said, you know, how do you, how do you develop a society like that? At what environmental cost? At what social cost? And how do you develop without the rule of law, where otherwise corruption is now the key issue? And maybe it is through the issue of corruption that the democratic discontent that we observe in various parts of the world, but in China as well, is uh, 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 being uh, uh, introduced. So I'm sure this will come to a discussion, including your last point about Patnam, your reference to Patnam. But of course, for him, the concern for democratic development relates to the existence of a civil society and a civic culture, you know, the whole theme of his book, Bowling Alone, is about the erosion of civil society, even in advanced democracies. And that, incidentally, was a concern of Václav Havel as well, that question of civil society and civic culture to which we may return. Our next uh, uh, speaker uh, comes from uh, Iran, Ramin uh, Jahan Begu. He's a philosopher. He teaches at the University of York in Canada. And he published recently his autobiography entitled, Time Will Say Nothing. Well, he will tell us yes. more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, um, do you hear me well? Oh, that's fine. I'm happy. Um, thank you to the organizers to invite me again uh, to this beautiful city and uh, Forum 2000. Um, I remember I was telling Jack that uh, I used to live in Paris the first time I came to um, Prague. It was in January 1991. President Havel, uh, I was a student of philosophy in France, and since I was working with the uh, Revue Esprit, I was uh, very active for Eastern Europe and a uh, very close friend of Jan Vladislav. Uh, and the late President uh, Havel actually uh, invited a big group of people, I think there was something like 500 uh, writers and poets and dissidents coming with the European Culture Club. And that was the first time I came here uh, to Prague in January 1990. And um, it's at the time, actually, that is very close to our uh, subject. Uh, at the time, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, everyone practically uh, thought that democracy had reached a level of political and moral legitimacy uh, that no existing form of governance could compete with it. Uh, and of course, m many of us here would co might continue thinking this way. And uh, but I mean, the, the 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 impression and the sentiment was much stronger at the time, 25 years ago. And of course, all forms of dissent uh, in and against uh, liberal democracy would be, become very suspicious and very rebuked. But um, I mean, I will start my point from here because I think this is a point of discussion that we need to have. Uh, liberal democracy is, uh, I would say, ascendancy around the world 
uh, has not always been accompanied with the ascendancy of a democratic passion. Uh, that's one of the problems we, I think we have. I mean by that uh, democratic man is no more an animal of democratic passion. Uh, this reminds me, of course, of what uh, the um, Dutch philosopher Spinoza used to say, that uh, without passion, even if uh, you have a human activity which is very rational and rationalist, uh, and is supported by reason, you still, it cannot prosper. It, you, you need to have passion, and especially in the domain of politics and in social work, you need to have this passion. So this is one of the challenges that we have today in Europe, in North America, many other places. Uh, you don't see this democratic passion. Of course, you see it in many places in the Middle East, Iran being one of them. You, we recently saw it in um, in the Arab Spring, uh, before uh, it went down, uh, and uh, of course we see it, see it in the, in the civil societies, but not at the level of the states anymore. So, one of the challenges that we have, 25 years later, that I'm in this city, is that even yesterday I was talking with my assistant, younger generation of uh, Czechs who don't remember anything from the time of the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, she was telling me that many of uh, he, her fellow students and fellow Czechs don't know much about Václav Havel. You know, I as an Iranian who studied in France, I've, I've, and I've been meeting uh, late uh, President Havel maybe three, four times, uh, and I have a photo in my book actually with him. Uh, I practically read everything he's written, but maybe some other Europeans of a younger age, of in their 20s, 30s, 20, when they are 25 years, they don't go and read anymore and they don't really know who was Jan Palash and what happened in 1968 here or elsewhere. So they have no memory of the Cold War and before that and uh, they have become very apathetic to, towards uh, democracy or this democratic passion that I was talking about because uh, most of us here present, we know that this democratic passion was also part of the, you know, uh, American and European mind, especially during the Second World War and after the Second World War, because of the struggle against fascism and Nazism in, uh, in Europe. Uh, another point which I think uh, is a point of discussion, I hope that you will come back with your questions and challenges, is what uh, the American philosopher John Dewey talked about, you know, when he said that uh, um, politics is being under the shadow of big business and is, this is haunting actually liberal democracies. This is one of the points that we see also around the world. I mean, uh, my friend Yogender Yadav is still is, uh, with a, he is uh, representing also his uh, political party in, in India. In India, one of the points uh, which is menacing actually uh, democratic politics is also big business, you know? Uh, so um, money sometimes goes against democratic passion. So we are left with the question, um, what is really left with democracy and what is left with the uh, demo democratic institutions? And of course, we can say that uh, People around the world, with the, from coming from different uh, cultures, they have different views of democracy and they under, different understandings of democracy. But nevertheless, let me conclude uh, by bringing several points of discussion, which I think is important. First of all, and this, I think, the work of Yogendra, uh, 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 working on democracy in Asia and especially in South Asia, actually uh, shows it very well. The, uh, I, think, I don't think we can promote democracy without a democratic culture. Uh, this is practically impossible. I mean, the experience of Iraq and Afghanistan shows us that. We need to have a democratic culture, otherwise we cannot uh, have a promotion of democracy. And also, if we want to have a promotion of democracy, we need to have an empowering, not only of one majority, but the empowering of the civic forces, civil society forces. And that also, I think, is very, very uh, important. So I go back to my Gandhian view of democracy because I'm a Gandhian scholar. And uh, I think that when we talk about democratic power, 
Democratic power is not power over the society, but is power within it. This is very important to know how we define things. Not power over, but power within. And because of that, we have to be very careful with what I can call the democratic evil, which is corruption. Corruption, what corruption in democracies, in liberal democracies, in South Asia, in East Asia, in, uh, uh, in other places, is, is a democratic evil. We can call it a democratic evil. And one of the aspects of this democratic evil would be the recognition of violence as a problematic for democracy, which underscores, uh, I would say, the activity, the status, uh, the status of the homo democraticus, the democratic man in general. And um, uh, let me finish just by saying that President Havel, in most of his writings, which I love to go and read again and again, he insists on what he calls the horizon of responsibility. Horizon of responsibility because he, uh, I quote him, he says democracy is based on the trust in the human sense of responsibility. Now, could we talk, since I was talking about democratic evil, since I was talking about the challenge of the absence of democratic passion, could we talk about democracy without civic responsibility? No, certainly not. Jack, actually, Jack talked about, and uh, they, it was pointed out by some other uh, people here present, I think that there is a sense of common responsibility which is a key to our identity as democratic beings and this is where I think it's very, very important to understand that when we're talking about democracy, we're talking also about a self-examination and dialogical exchange in a society. Without that, I think that it would be impossible to come back and redefine democracy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ramin. And uh, I'm always uh, impressed and uh, always astonished, although I've come across it so often, that, you know, people in Iran reading Havel, familiar, they've read everything, you know. You go to Beijing, you meet people who've read Havel. Apparently, he's been translated in uh, Egypt, you know, during the Arab Spring, etc. So there you have, you know, the global resonance of his questioning uh, about democracy and sometimes that legacy being, if not uh, forgotten, but sometimes neglected <laughs> in the place where uh, it actually was first developed. But maybe, uh, maybe Karl Schwarzenberg will correct that impression. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but let me first give the floor to our last speaker, but then you will uh, correct. And, and uh, our, our last uh, speaker, who is uh, uh, Professor Michael Novak, uh, theologian, political scientist, and he is the author of a book, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, which was also translated into Czech. So this may be the answer, I mean, to your question. You had, you had asked, you know, the John Dewey question about the relation of politics and big business. Mm. Well, there you have uh, democracy, politics, and the spirit of capitalism. This is Michael Novak's uh, favorite theme, as I understand it. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for having me. I, I love to come to the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic because my family is from Spish in Slovakia, both my mother's family and my father's family. An occasion like this, an anniversary, is a cause to go back in memory. My first visit in this part of the world was in 1974, when I managed to, I was working with the Rockefeller Foundation and I managed to slip into Slovakia for a week uh, to visit my family there. Four years later, I was invited back. It was after Char Charter 77, about whom I had written favorably. I was writing a lot about the relationship between American Slovaks and Slovakia, and all of us, about one in every 10 Americans has a grandparent from behind the Iron Curtain. It's quite astonishing. When I was ambassador to the United Nations in Human Rights for Ronald Reagan, 
I often made a point of saying to the Soviets, look, uh, you, you accuse us when we bring up human rights issues of interfering in your national affairs. I said, we look at it very differently. So many of our families come from behind the Iron Curtain that these are not international affairs, these are family affairs. And we have a responsibility to speak. Well, in 1978, I was invited back to lecture. I couldn't lecture in the Czech part because of Charter 77, Havel was in jail, and, and um, but I still had an invitation through the American ambassador to come to lecture at the University in Preshov in Slovakia. I was lectured first in Poland, again, on the subject of families between Poland and America and in general Central Europe. And at the very last minute, my visa was canceled. So I got as far as Krakow, I was going to take the midnight train, it was canceled. I can't express to you how gloomy and how dismal and how dark Central Europe looked in those days. I was amazed to watch people in the streets of Warsaw, even more of Krakow, walking with their heads down, looking at no one, living in their private world. An amazing thing about communism is it didn't create community, it created privatization. People not sure who they could trust, even in their own families. It drove people deeply inward into a kind of individuality I have never seen in the liberal world. Well, leave that aside. But I would never have predicted in those days that we would be here 25 years after 1980. I never predicted that 1989 would happen. I thought it would be 20, I wrote that it would be 2010, between 2010 and 20. It was coming, but I didn't think it could be so fast. And I would never have predicted once 1989 came, I tried to look at the future, I could not have predicted we would be here in 25 years. And a global community, say what you want about big business, it has made it possible for you and for you and for me to be here in two days. Um, and say what you want about big business, it makes possible this organization if there were not sources of private wealth, we would have to depend on government. You cannot have a free civil society without free private wealth. But that's another topic. My main topic is this. I thought it would be 50 or 70 years before we could be to this place. Because democracy is a long-term project. It doesn't happen in one generation. It doesn't happen in three generations. It takes much longer than that. Think how long it took the United States to overcome slavery, and then to come to recognition of the full civil rights of those who had been formerly slaves. It is a, always a progressive becoming. So when I come here, I am filled with astonishment and excitement. I never would have believed that we could have come so far in 25 years. Because we had to do three enormous tasks at once. We had to have a deep moral conversion, a profound moral conversion. Because democracy is, first of all, a change in moral life. And this Havel was exactly right. It means the becoming adult and taking responsibility. It means looking to see what needs to be done and then doing it. It's not a new form of government, it's a new form of people, first of all. So there has to be a huge cultural revolution. I pick up the point of my colleague. Secondly, there needs to be an economic revolution from a society in which things come from above. My grandparents, my great-grandparents in Slovakia, before, before World War I, had essentially three simple duties. To 
pray, to pay, and to obey. When they came to America, they were not citizens, they were subjects of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That's what was on their passports. Suddenly in America, they become citizens and they are responsible for figuring out how to live, what it means to be an American, how, to, how much to change oneself to become American. Secondly, they had to take personal initiative for their own work. They could not look to agriculture. They could not look to government. They had to use personal creative initiative to start to find their own work and create their own jobs. And then third, they were not subjects, they were now the sovereigns. The government belongs to the people. Government officials work for the people and people have the right to fire them. It's not much of a right as Winston Churchill said, democracy is a very poor form of government. It's only that all the others are worse. It, it, it is not, in order to be serious about democracy, you have to be content to be discontent. It is never paradise on earth. And all the things that need to be changed are your own responsibility. And it's a big burden. People don't like that burden. Dostoevsky wrote that everybody cries out for liberty. Give me liberty. Give it to them. In 15 minutes, they start giving it back because they do not like the responsibility. Well, I, th I think that is our predicament, but what I want to stress is the miracle that has been achieved through the bravery of people like Václav Havel and thousands of others around the world. My colleague has written his prison memoirs. That is one of the main forms of literature of the 20th century. Solzhenitsyn, Mihailo Mihailov, Cubans, Iranians, Egyptians. In fact, the great discovery of the last few years is how much abuse of human rights and how much suffering there has been in the former Ottoman Empire in, in the Middle East. Abuses and human rights thought little of until the last 10 years or so. I think the most neglected, most abused, most suffering people uh, for a very long time. When I was at the United Nations in the 1980s, we almost never spoke about abuses in the Middle East. The Soviets didn't want to, and we had to be careful. Um, and there were problems we knew better and knew better how to address. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going on too long. But I want simply to congratulate the group. I never would have dreamed that Prague could be as beautiful and bright again. So many lights, so many colors, people walking in the streets with vigor and their heads up, planning, and the same in, in war and all over. I, and I thought that would be utopian to believe that, but here it is, in fact. And we, we need to take comfort in what we have done because we always have so many discontents to contend with. Thank you. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we have a chance now for the panelists, if they want to respond to each other, if they have heard something that uh, in their minds deserves a reaction. I think you wanted to react to something, and Iveta as well. About, yeah. uh, because I was mentioned before, Iran and Egypt. One should forget. Doesn't it, doesn't it work? Ah. Yes. Uh, that, uh, okay. May I have it? Yeah, oh, yes. It's now working. it works. Uh, that uh, demo uh, it, democracy works only if it's based on proper government. So, uh, halfway working as administration and the rule of law. If one tries to introduce a democracy without it, we see the wonderful results we had in Iran, in Egypt, and in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Uh, in Central Europe, I mean, the Czechoslovakia uh, had in the 20s the luck because they had a good judicial system inherited from the old Austrian Empire and uh, quite good governments. Then it's possible to introduce democracy. If you introduce it as such, it, it leads to catastrophic results. That was a big fight I had, discussion I had years ago with Sharansky, who preached, uh, especially to George W. Bush, that the most important thing is to topple the old regime and introduce democracy. It, if it works like, would work like that, we would have another world. At first, we would introduce rule of law and a proper administration uh, or government, and it worked. One shouldn't forget that in, in Europe we needed hmm, quite a lot of time. I would say the start uh, to democracy was in England in the famous moment when a judge sentenced the Black Prince, who was the Crown Prince of England. Something unheard before, that a simple judge could sentence the, the oldest king, uh, son of the king, and uh, heir to the kingdom. There, the development of democracy started, which developed into present British democracy. And uh, on the continent, uh, independent justice, and uh, sometimes earlier started, admittedly, uh, proper governments. But independent justice started rather late, maybe in the 19th century. And then, in the 20th century, we could have a democracy. Uh, why do we expect that in other parts of the world, uh, democracy uh, can start to work immediately without uh, such educational preparation for it. It, it, It's impossible. We need precondition to have democracy. Uh, democracy is nothing which understands and work immediately. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think this is a very interesting point, you know, to what extent you need preconditions, the rule of law for democracy. And then, of course, if you have those institutional and rule of law precondition, that presumably helps you cope better with the discontents of democracy that inevitably come after. And of course, what we have seen in other parts of the world, that we had a, a democratic change, not only without rule of law, but without necessarily considering that the Western model of democracy is a reference point. So we have in the Arab world, for instance, we have the Arab Spring, they have a model of democracy, but which is not westernization or Europeanization. It is not our model. They, they claim to have a different model of democracy, and they would, of course, argue that uh, you know, this is a legitimate uh, way to pursue different roads to democracy. And then, of course, uh, we have a slightly different debate. But a moderator must moderate himself and not talk. Iveta Radichova was then, and I think you next, and perhaps you want it? Yeah, OK, good. OK. I have in my mind uh, only one um, word, Mr. and Mrs. No Name. What I have in my mind, during the one, one century, uh, the organization of the society is that it between the citizen and the politician who, have a, who, have, who has the legitimacy huge amount of institutions as, in quotation, Mr. and Mrs. No Name, who are responsible to moderate all the services, uh, needs, and communication in between government and citizen. Uh, one example, conflict Russia and Ukraine. I'm asking whole diplomacy, all the colosseum of institutions, uh, what they really have done. We know the answer. We know the answer. Diplomatic instruments didn't work. Sorry, we have to find another way what to do as a next step. 
Okay, I will continue. Institution like United Nations. Okay, what they did because of the conflict, etc., etc., etc. And I am citizen looking on this and asking, come on, this institution is responsible, but nothing has happened. This institution is responsible, and nothing has happened. Uh, there is a crisis. We know who is responsible, and nothing has happened, except the changes of governments. Uh, but the whole system of organizations and institutions is not changed at all. That's why I call it Mr. and Mrs. No Name. Uh, <coughs> both sides are fighting with something which now has more power than politicians itself and than citizens itself. Uh, I would like to stress that yes, it's absolutely important to have a rule of law. But if you are in the situation, good example, and it's not a joke, that you have American justice system and you have to decide, sorry, once more, you have to decide if you prefer American system of justice with Soviet lawyer and judge or Soviet system of justice and American judge, our constitutional lawyers the answer, answer this question, I prefer American judge. So it's based on really personal, personal behavior and responsibility of concrete institutions and personalities. Nobody is responsible. Nobody. I repeat, except prime ministers and governments. And institutions are there with more and more and more power. And openly, sometimes I do not understand who really decide such and such a uh, problem. Uh, yes, it's a consequence of so-called informative society, yes. I am not able to work with such amount of information and news. I need somebody who will select, who will interpret, and mainly to help me decide what is truth and what is not the truth. Therefore, we have more and more mediators in between decision makers and another side of the society. And we fall sometime, somewhere to the hands and power of bureaucracy and institutions, we were created for better life. By, but now it is really in opposite. Last sentence, three-fourths of the <coughs> economy in Europe is based on services, advisors, financial institutions, and I don't know what. And they are doing something <laughs> which resulted in the question or task for politicians, please ask citizens once more and once more to be the heroes and to help us to solve the problem with, uh, during the wars, during the crisis, during the conflicts, uh, because somebody no name, did absolutely wrong decision. That's the problem. Says the former Slovak Prime Minister, somebody took the wrong decision. Yes. She has a name though, I mean, we know she's here. And uh, Michael Novak, you wanted uh... There is a problem that you need institutions Sure. rule of law, etc. On the other hand, if you don't give responsibility to citizens right away, you will not get those institutions. So it is an interesting mix which comes first. But you, you actually need, the Americans were thrown into this. We, were, we had great advantages, so I don't want to argue that way. But we learned our institutions how? By experiment and in different states with different experiments, different forms of government. 
and by failures. So trial and error. But the point is, the point belongs to Tocqueville and to Václav Havel. Tocqueville said that the first law of democracy is a habit of association. We are not alone. We can live a social life and a political life on our own. We have many political parties, many movements, uh, many organizations of citizens and thousands of... One thing you do if you're in a free society is you, you belong to too many committees and you go to too many meetings. That's what self-government means. What did, what did Václav Havel call his party? Civic? Civic Forum. Yeah. But it was not a party and it didn't last long. But anyway, but the you point, have a point. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, he, he believed in the principle and for that he started Civic Forum. We are not a government. We are citizens who see a need. We need to do thinking and somebody has, so we have to do it. We take responsibility for it. Uh, that's, you know, I, I want to repeat, democracy is not the government officials. Democracy is the people working through their associations and having as much liberty as possible to do that and the rule of law. Without the rule of law, there is nothing. So, anyway. Yes. Uh, so you wanted some? No. No? Can I say you something? Wanted, yeah. Yes, I just wanted, uh, Michael Novak actually said that we have to be content of our discontent. And I would say that we also need to be discontent of our content <laughs> in democracies. That's what makes democracies democracies. Because when you live in democracies or you are engaged in a democratic uh, passion or democratic, you understand that there is no such thing as a political perfection. And I mean, all those who believed in political perfection actually turned out to be totalitarian regimes or uh, uh, failures, I mean, uh, as states or as, uh, as societies. So this uh, being content of our discontent is actually when, we, we, this is what I call that it, uh, it's, it's at the, um, uh, it helps the democratic passion and it helps the empowering the civil society. But being discontent of our content also turns out that what we call democratic individu individualism, which is actually what Isaiah Berlin called uh, negative liberty, will not turn out to become a hedonistic individualism. And that's what the, one of the dangers also in our democratic, liberal democratic societies, when the democratic individualism turns out to be only hedonistic. You know, as you mentioned, uh, Constant, uh, La joie de vivre, uh, you just, you're in private sphere and you just want to enjoy, and this is hedonistic individualism. So, these are the one point that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, we <coughs> almost ran out of time, but not completely, and there's a chance for people in the audience to ask a question or two. I see Ambassador Jantowski <laughs> wanting to intervene. Well, thank you. I, I wanted to thank and compliment all the panelists on, on, on a most interesting uh, uh, discussion. And, uh, and what was striking for me was that there were several explanatory models offered for uh, the current state of affairs and for a degree of discontent with uh, uh, democracy that we may be experiencing. Karel Schwarzenberg uh, spoke about the boredom with democracy, there was a mention about uh, about uh, the economic uh, uh, determinants of uh, of discontent. Uh, Michael Novak basically said that everything is fine; that uh, uh, that uh, discontent is a natural state of affairs in a democracy, and I fully agree with that. And uh, and Jacques, you said that there are. Uh, you know, other ways in which people understand democracy, other, you know, forms of uh, what they may think of as democracy. I think we remember that we had people's democracy at, uh, at one time, and we, we, we all, all remember how much it had to do with, uh, uh, with, uh, with democracy. But my question is this. Uh, there is another uh, perspective which uh, uh, which is more serious in that 
this may not be just a, a random fluctuation of our inevitable progress to democracy, which only will take time, as also somebody said here, that, that in some ways for the first time since 1989, not just this part of the world, but other parts of the world uh, may, be, may be slipping back. That there, the tide you know, may be turning. Is it just a, a pessimistic uh, take on, on what's happening, or, or is it slightly more serious than that? Thank you. Well, very good question. Who of the, <clears throat> who of the panelists would like to address that one? You? OK. Yeah, well, um, difficult as it is for a situation in China, I think the tide will return because um, we have so many problems, and these problems cannot be effectively resolved with uh, democracy. Um, so at the present, it cannot be solved with democracy? We, we, without. Without. With, okay. without. I wanted to make sure that I heard properly. Well, <laughs> with just, democracy, just for the record. <laughs> with democracy, I'm not really sure whether it will be definitely resolved. But without democracy, as, as we see from our perspective, it would definitely would, would not be. But uh, our problem is that um, um, you know, people's freedom are so limited. And uh, democracy needs some minimum institutional um, precondition to, to work. Uh, and, but because um, the, uh, our freedom in free speech, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, elections, and uh, in candidates for themselves to stand out, uh, to conduct campaign, and so on, or uh, being curtailed by the government restrictions, uh, but some of these restrictions are beginning to sort of um, um, uh, going down because um, uh, we have, you know, especially in the internet environment, people communicate more easily. And um, um, in the last elections, for example, we have uh, over 100 independent, can so-called independent <coughs> candidates across the country. Uh, they did not succeed at the very end, but I'm sure that in the future, uh, the trend is moving toward the direction that more and more independent candidates would stand up. And uh, so, well, hopefully before long. You know, I, don't, I cannot make any progress, uh, promise, but uh, democracy will arrive in China as well. Okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> yes, I know something about Mrs. and Mr. No Name. <laughs> uh, everybody uh, know because we are in touch every day with these kind of institutions. I think, and I absolutely agree, that if we have a look on democracy last century, so there is no decline concerning the support of democracy as a system, but fluctuating support because of concrete situation in a concrete region or sub-region. Uh, this fluctuating support dependent uh, on demo so-called democratic deficit. It means gap in between expectations of citizens on one side and concrete possibilities and force to fulfill these expectations of citizens. Uh, we are facing the gap because, now deeper, because we are facing real economic uh, and financial crisis. And it is interconnected with valuation of the governments and valuation of the regimes. And I have to repeat that if we finish, in quotation, this kind of crisis without serious changes of uh, competent institutions, citizens will not start to trust us once more. They, the distrust will be still on the table. Um, concretely, there is not a problem with support of integration of Europe as a value and idea, but there is strong distrust and dissatisfaction with the institutions of EU. 
there is not distrust to the common sense and will to live in peace, but there is very strong disagreement and tension uh, looking on what concrete national and international institutions are doing for keeping the peace. So here is the problem. That's why I tried to stress that yes, we have to have these institutions, but Michael, you know as a sociologist that such phenomena have now their own life and they are very, very far from what was the former idea of functioning of this kind of institutions. That's why in Great Britain there is reopening of the question to reform institutions of EU. That's why there is very low participation and at EU uh, election procedure because of this distrust to the concrete institutions. <coughs> and uh, to conclude, citizens really have right not to trust <coughs> to rating agencies as they really didn't measure the real deep problems in Europe before the crisis to Eurostat, to European Commission, etc., etc. And what we have done as a result? We are changing the governments and state administration and institutions without any change. That's the problem. Well, thank you very much. I think unless there is an, yeah, one quick uh, very conclusion. Quick. And, and, and Maybe what, what I, I think in the, answer the, to uh, what uh, he actually the question was, uh, I think there are two challenges. One is the challenge of democracy building. One is the challenge of democracy keeping, which we can call democratizing democracies. And in both cases, we need education of democracy. I mean, the uh, recent European Parliament elections shows us that with the rise of the ultra-wing uh, parties in Europe, we need. In, even in liberal democracy in Europe, the education of the democratic education is, is a very important point. Okay. Uh, one thing I think helps to, uh, the envy of the democracy in Europe too, that our traditional political parties uh, became empty. Uh, they, they have all founded in the 19th century. Originally, there was a Liberals and out of the liberals that developed the social democrats, Christian democrats, uh, new liberals and so on. And now uh, they don't offer since 50 years any more new ideas. Last time new ideas came into uh, European politics uh, was 68, that more or less landed in the green, different green parties, not always, but mostly. But since then, there was no idea. And of course, there are, nobody believed in the parties, in the old ideas anymore. Uh, I would like to meet one younger leftist politician in Europe who knows about the basic ideas, the rules of social democracy. I would like to meet a Christian Democrat politic who still uh, has read Rerum uh, Novarum or Quadragesimo Anno. We are all kind of liberal parties, which is a tragedy for the liberal parties themselves, because more or less uh, all parties have accepted what uh, was their message, and uh, no, no new idea is offered. So why should you, as a spectator, go to the theatre where since 50 years it always the same performance. Some theatres in London are successful with it, but the, it is a rare thing. So I do think as long as we don't have some new ideas uh, in, for politics, the absence and the boredom and the, uh, yes, uh, even uh, hatred to, to traditional political parties will go on. We have to offer some new ideas. Mm -hmm. Still the old, 
uh, like an Italian Rebolita, uh, with hardly uh, well-performing actors, is not interesting. We have to bring some ideas to attract people. Why should this otherwise follow a traditional political party? Mm -hmm. Well, then, thank you very much to all of you. I was asked by the organizers to provide a three-point summary which they will use for whatever purposes. Um, <laughs> let me uh, just say in one word. Um, <clears throat> first, is the democratic discontent, is it, uh, is it uh, Worrying disease? Should we uh, 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 should we consider it as a threat, or should we adopt a more laid-back attitude that most of the panelists uh, took here? Well, it all depends. If you look at the symptoms, simply decline in participation and protest movements that do not offer alternatives, then you can take the laid-back attitude. I'm not as laid back, I'm not a panelist, but I'm not uh, as laid back, because I saw in the context of this democratic fatigue, emergence of radical populist parties with xenophobic agendas, with not very uh, democratic pluralist uh, culture, and they are on the rise, they are spreading, and if we are too laid back, they may, <laughs> Uh, if not come to power, have a decisive influence on our politics. So that is one reservation. The second we've discussed was the causes, what roots, and of course each panelist had slightly different take on that. One big issue we didn't have time to discuss uh, is of course the disconnect between a global market economy and national democracy. This is the main source, as I see it, of the democratic discontent. Vote for governments that do not decide much. When Karl Schwarzenberg says, you know, all parties have now adopted more or less liberal economic policy, well, that has to do something. You have a global squeeze <laughs> of, uh, uh, of politics by the, uh, by the market forces, and uh, you have no democracy without market economy. But we have also discovered in the crisis that the market economy globally can shrink the space, the democratic space, nationally. So that is a basic question for us. And finally, what to do about it? Well, again, we've heard a number of uh, responses to that. I take from what I've heard in different quarters the question of the rule of law as a condition for democracy. I've heard that it's a long-term process that uh, you mentioned, and the idea that uh, yes, you can build democratic institution, but at the end of the day, you also need a democratic civic culture, and that without that, those institutions will not last. Well, thank to all the panelists. Thanks for you, to you for uh, uh, for listening and for taking part in this. And the debate is only starting. We have two days to discuss the discontents of democracy.